an all new Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Something's already in motion, something big. An invisible evil is on the attack. Mitch, what happened? It hit me. What hit you? Okay, I know someone's here. How exactly do you propose to hunt someone you can't see? What can't be seen can be deadly. I'm invisible. An all new Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Next week. Incredible how you can See right through me Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 1 Episode 11, Out of Mind, Out of Sight, sometimes billed as Invisible Girl, is written by Joss Whedon with the teleplay by writing team Ashley Gable and Thomas A. Sweden, who brought us the worst episode of all time, Season 1 Episode 8, I, Robot, You, Jane, and directed by Reza Badi. Of all of the episodes in the season, this is probably my favorite one. We're coming up on the end of the season now, and before the big fight of the finale, it's time to focus on the high school setting and take a closer look at Cordelia. This is all about me! Me, me, me! Cordelia is a mean girl, but she has a redemption arc in her future. Joss didn't get to tell the story he wanted to tell in the movie, largely due to the interference of Donald Sutherland. So Cordelia is a rehashed version of his original conception of Buffy, a Buffy 2.0 if you will. The movie, or its graphic novel adaptation The Origin, has Buffy get over her initial mean girl popular status very quickly, but Cordelia is slower to come around. Out of Mind, Out of Sight focuses on Cordelia's negative influence and contains the first inklings of her better nature. The monster of the week is an invisible girl named Marcy Ross, played by Clea Duvall, who would later star alongside Sarah Michelle Gellar in The Grudge. Hmm, maybe it's my imagination, but the name Marcy sounds a bit like Carrie. And Ross? That sounds like the name of the boy that Carrie took to the prom. Hmm. Carrie, the movie, what? you know? A fair number of Buffy episodes are thematically based on popular horror stories, and Out of Mind, Out of Sight is loosely based on two of them. It's based on the 1974 book Carrie by Stephen King and its 1976 film adaptation, and it is also somewhat based on the 1897 book The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells and its 1933 film adaptation. In Carrie, a girl abused by high school bullies and her own mother develops psychic powers and uses them to empower herself. Things start to go well for her, until she becomes the victim of a cruel prank and takes her bloody revenge on everyone in sight. It wasn't that bad. You burned down the gym. I did, I really did, but, but you're not seeing the big picture here. Carrie is often beloved by victims of bullying for its function as a power fantasy, and feminists tend to like it because of its demonstration of female power in response to oppression that includes a fair bit of misogyny. However, it's not necessarily a feminist story. In his 1981 horror analysis book, Danza Macabre, Stephen King said this, Carrie is largely about how women find their own channels of power, but also what men fear about women and women's sexuality. Writing the book in 1973 and only three years out of college, I was fully aware of what women's liberation implied for me and others of my sex. The book is, in its more adult implications, an uneasy masculine shrinking from a future of female equality. For me, Carrie White is woman feeling her powers for the first time and, like Samson, pulling down the temple on everyone in sight at the end of the book. Carrie can be seen as a figure representing women affected by feminism, as seen through the eyes of a privileged man of the era. He lets the audience feel sympathy for her and root for her to be empowered, but at the same time shows the dangers of women possessing power. It's ultimately a cautionary tale about letting women have too much power. Her defeat is then a victory of civilized people over feminism glorifying patriarchy as the status quo, while keeping alive this fear that she or someone like her may return some point in the future. It represents paranoid misogyny, misidentifying women's efforts to be regarded as equal, as a threat to all men. The story of Carrie is fundamentally sexist. But that's not the end of it. Carrie can be reinterpreted. Its adaptations can distance themselves from the sexism. Out of mind, out of sight. And later, 
Angel Season 2, Episode 4, Untouched, take the general premise of Carrie and rework it to tell feminist stories. Out of Mind, Out of Sight, and Untouched are interesting to compare as different takes on the same premise of retelling Carrie. Out of Mind, Out of Sight replaces the telekinesis plot element with invisibility, but otherwise stays pretty true to the plot of Carrie, as is allowed by Buffy's high school setting. While Untouched retains the telekinesis element and some general themes, but radically changes the plot to better fit with Angel's private investigation versus evil law firm setting. The invisibility part borrows from The Invisible Man, as is paid homage to in the alternate title Invisible Girl. The Invisible Man involves a man named Griffin, creating a drug that turns him invisible. He is soon corrupted by that power and commits various crimes, leading up to murder. He eventually tries to take over the world in a manner similar to Light Yagami. Unlike Carrie, which uses a sympathetic villain protagonist, the Invisible Man treats the villain as an other, observed by various village people and his old colleague. Also, while Carrie is purely fantastical, The Invisible Man is technically an example of medical science fiction, attempting to describe the invisibility condition from a scientific standpoint. Out of Mind, Out of Sight uses many of these elements, including having a scientific basis for invisibility and grounding the episode in science fiction. Ultimately, though, the focus of the episode is the retelling of Carrie. I've gotta stop a crazy from pulling a Carrie at the prompt. The episode starts with Cordelia, her boy toy Mitch, and Harmony happily walking down the hall. They're popular, so life is great. Then Buffy trips and stumbles out in front of them. She lies at their feet as they taunt her. Positioning a character above another is typically used to establish dominance. And Buffy is often the dominant figure, as seen in Season 1, Episode 2, The Harvest, and Season 1, Episode 6, The Pack, when arriving to rescue people from monsters. But even the powerful Slayer is rendered helpless in response to high school bullying. She just wants to be friends, but the popular kids are compelled to abuse all who are subordinate to them. Even Buffy is vulnerable. People call them the Cordettes. Bunch of girls from wealthy families. They ruled the high school, decided what was in, who was popular. It was like the Soviet secret police if they cared a lot about shoes. I love her vulnerability before Cordelia. Some feminists think that Buffy needs to be perfectly strong all the time to be a good feminist hero, but I disagree. I love her human weakness. Even as a warrior, she's still a relatable teen girl figure. Sometimes things are just bad and people suffer, and there should be a moment to appreciate that suffering. While Cordelia is the character focus of the episode, the overall theme is how high school interpersonal relations can be toxic, and this is emphasized through Buffy herself being a victim of it. In different hands, this could have been executed very poorly, but Joss Whedon and Reza Badii do a good job. In class, they discuss the Merchant of Venice and Shalok's plea to be recognized as human in his Hath Not a Jew Hands speech. Hath Not a Jew Eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by a Christian example? Why, revenge. The villainy you teach me I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Everyone sees Shalak as a pitiable victim, except for Cordelia, who takes the opposing side. She, who has always been on top, with very little sympathy for those she abuses, associates Sherlock's play with the annoying way that she perceives the people whom she hurts to only care about themselves, and to whine ignoring whatever distress that she may be feeling. She's like a comic book villain, or you know, this guy. By which I mean the lawyer, of course. Ironically, the reading of Sherlock as a pitiable victim is largely a distortion based on too many people just reading the cliff notes. Sherlock is a Jewish bad guy written by an anti-Semitic playwright. The character has sympathetic moments, but Cordelia's reading is absolutely on point. She herself is essentially Sherlock, somewhat sympathetic, but otherwise to be hated for caring too much for only herself. Cordelia tells a story about her running over a bicyclist. Cordelia didn't mean to hurt anyone, so the shock was very traumatic to her. That's a legitimate reaction. However, she then got angry with the girl whom she hit 
for screaming about a broken leg and ignoring Cordelia's pain, which is obviously not legitimate. The victim deserves the most sympathy, and Cordelia not understanding that is a problem born of her overall disrespect for other people. The scene is designed to make the audience unsympathetic to her so that they would watch the episode with a growing sense of hate for Cordelia. But there is a hint of legitimacy to Cordelia's complaint. Big time legitimate pain. In a way, Cordelia was also a victim of the accident and is deserving of some empathy. And this foreshadows the episode later giving her respect. Despite totally blowing the Merchant of Venice analysis, at least as far as the episode writing projects, the teacher praises Cordelia's interpretation. When Cordelia then asks the teacher for some leniency and some help with a paper, the teacher is all too happy to oblige. The glance from Willow indicates that this is something that most people wouldn't get away with. Cordelia's popularity and charm, dare I say, charisma, allows her privileges that the other students don't have which is a theme we see later with the Privileged Swim Team in Season 2, Episode 20, Go Fish. A lot of filing, giving things names. In 1989, at the start of Third Wave Feminism, Peggy McIntosh wrote an influential essay called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. In it, she describes various positive things that white people experience on basis of their skin color that are denied to people of color, and she defines these as white privileges. As a result of growing up with white privilege, white people are more inclined to behave in a racist manner, often unknowingly. This concept was well known by race activists and had been in academic discussion since 1935 with W.E.B. Du Bois' essay Black Reconstruction. But McIntosh's own white privilege helped it to foster within mainstream feminism and gave third wave feminism a framework through which to address various forms of privilege in society. Which falls under the heading of ironic in my book. Joss's feminist belief solidified well before then, and he hasn't really kept up with feminist philosophy. So I'm guessing he didn't have that framework when writing Out of Mind, Out of Sight. I think he was aware of the general concept of privilege, but he had no name for it. As a result, we see examples of privilege in Cordelia's overall behavior, but they are not rendered as discrete performances, and exist more as a general theme throughout the episode. I often see feminists quote Cordelia talking about Shalak as an example of privilege, and while that's not wrong per se, it isn't a perfect description of it either. It's a privilege. As Cordelia and Harmony chatter excitedly about a new dress, we cut to the boys' locker room to focus on Mitch as he becomes vulnerable to Marcy. The scene recalls the opening of the show with Darla playing the weak girlfriend of the strong boy and ends up being the monster to kill him, replacing a typical display of masculine power with that of the feminine. Throughout the season, we've seen a lot of female vulnerability in the locker room. From Season 1, Episode 3, Witch, to I, Robot, You, Jane, to Season 1, Episode 9, Puppet Show. It is recognizable as a setting where women could easily be stalked and preyed upon. When Mitch first struts around, the locker room has no equivalent connotation of vulnerability for him. It even feels like a place of power, which he expresses when he talks to his buddies about only being interested in Cordelia for the chance of getting to have sex with her. A hint that Cordelia's status may not be as wonderful as first apparent. When he then becomes a target of Marcy's aggressions, it is in subversion of the expectations of male power and feminine weakness. Well now, that's a twist. There is also the level of the scene being a parallel to Carrie. Carrie also has a locker room scene, an iconic one. Carrie menstruates for the first time, freaks out, and then a bunch of abusive teen girls throw tampons at her, one of which dressed like she wants to fight Donkey Kong. It is a scene that emphasizes feminine weakness and frames the undressed forms of the teen girls for the consumption of male viewers. Out of Mind, Out of Sight instead emphasizes the rarely seen masculine weakness and frames his undressed form, as much as they can show, for female consumption, emphasized by Marcy's giggles. It's one of the show's feminist twists on the Carrie story. Cheapers. The fact that Mitch is specifically rendered sexually vulnerable is also worth consideration. In general, Buffy doesn't do the best job of depicting male sexual vulnerability as equally legitimate to its female equivalent. Season 1, Episode 4, Teacher's Pet positions Sander as sexually vulnerable to the She-Mantis, but we still don't get as much of a sense of a threat from her explicit sexual interest in him as we do from Thomas's implicit sexual interest in Willow. In Season 1, Episode 1, Welcome to the Hellmouth. This in mind, it's good to appreciate the unambiguous examples of male sexual vulnerability where they do show up. Much appreciated. It's still a bit of a double standard in how it's framed, though. Mitch's nude form is linked with power. He holds himself with great dignity, and he's quick to respond with aggression when he hears a girl giggling. 
He doesn't even have the vulnerability of Xander being stripped by the nightmare effect in season 1 episode 10 Nightmares, which I don't associate with sexual vulnerability because Xander isn't framed for female consumption so much as empathy, with the makeup and lighting emphasizing his unattractive paleness, while the red undertones of Mitch's skin are emphasized to draw attention to his body. Women are looking at Mitch and voyeuristically participating in Marcy's intrusion into his privacy, but we are led to appreciate his strength more than anything. Hearing a girl giggling nearby, Mitch reaches for a baseball bat to physically engage her, which is morally equivalent to Buffy attacking Andy for groping her. Marcy grabs the bat from him and bludgeons him with it. Lucky 19! Suddenly, the man loses the power in the scene. Suddenly, the locker room becomes dangerous to men, too. And even though you can't see her, Marcy's giggling gives the attacker active femininity. The Darla twist is back in full force prompting the need for Buffy as a female hero to defend helpless men, in line with the show's main theme of subverting the traditional patriarchal power dynamic. It's about power. Cordelia campaigns for the role of May Queen, using a tactic we'll see again in Season 3, Episode 5, Homecoming, where she hands out candy with her initials on it so that voters will create a positive association with her. This is something that professional marketing strategists do all the time, and Cordelia coming up with it herself is a sign of her understated intelligence. She's also quick to use it to reinforce her dominance, both within her social group and with Buffy. The scene effectively emphasizes her social standing and how mean she is about it. They don't even have the excuse of being possessed by hyenas. We may not care so much about Harmony as one of the mean kids being put in her place, but when Harmony joins Cordelia in looking down at Buffy, it emphasizes the group's disdain. Even the most subordinate Cordette is superior to Buffy on the high school totem pole. And Cordelia is that much above her, though Harmony's status in relation to Cordelia will change throughout the next two seasons. This basic role as an emphasis of Cordelia's status in the high school hierarchy will be the only role that she will fulfill until the season three finale. But we still don't know what that role is. Buffy is again slighted by Cordelia's insult. Even though she's a powerful warrior, she's vulnerable to school politics. She just wants to be Cordelia's friend, and Cordelia keeps being so mean to her. The scene very effectively leads us to sympathize with her as she awkwardly tries to regain her dignity. It's sad because we know that Cordelia doesn't have to be mean, but she nevertheless causes people distress. Buffy can't even take comfort in hanging out with Willow and Xander because they have been friends longer than her and they unintentionally isolate her further. So one by one they turn from me. Xander mocks Cordelia for wanting to be May Queen and Buffy admits that she was May Queen at her school. Henry High. Xander dismissively says that Buffy doesn't need popular kid culture anymore because she now has a place with him and Willow. This is jerkish behavior on his part, but Willow agrees with him, so it's less Xander jerkishness and more just high school kid ignorance. Joss Whedon has said both that he relates most to Xander as the goofy nerd who hangs out with strong women, and that Cordelia's mean behavior in Welcome to the Hellmouth and the Harvest borrowed from Joss's own mean behavior in school that he now regrets. So I think it's reasonable to imagine that he puts himself into both Xander and Cordelia with regard to their bad behavior and out of mind, out of sight, as part of a message condemning the overall hostility of high school social dynamics. Every high school in this country, from one end to the other, smells exactly alike. Mitch is discovered beaten badly, but still alive. He reports a bat attacking him by itself. Willow and Xander distract Snyder so that Buffy can check out the crime scene. She pokes at the bat and finds that it's lifeless. Whatever it is, it isn't the bat. She finds a message that says, Look. Buffy thinks that this intelligent display means that the culprit is unlikely to be a monster, and Giles agrees with her. Giles suggests three possibilities. One, someone with telekinesis. Two, an invisible creature. Or three, a poltergeist. Unlike his list of Hellmouth creatures that includes Incubi and Succubi, we will actually see each of these characters in the show. Also, his mentioning telekinesis as the first possibility feels like a nod to Carrie. Just nod and smile, hmm? Willow hones in on the poltergeist suggestion, and Buffy has her compile a list of dead or missing kids based on the idea that it could be a ghost. I always like when they go off in the wrong direction based on reasonable thought processes. It's a bit more realistic than what you typically see in the genre, which is usually either everyone being right on the first guess or being wrong in an unbelievably stupid way. I also like it when Buffy takes command like a general and they all respect her as the leader of their group. Shouldn't a list of dead or missing kids at Sunnydale High be gigantic, though? 
It would be like searching for a needle in a stack of needles. Needles. Should have thought of that. Xander complains about having to help Giles do research and demands Buffy's role of investigating Mitch until he learns that this would involve talking to Cordelia. Then he embraces research. It's a cute way to emphasize how Cordelia is intimidating, humorously using Xander's flaws of being whiny and less inclined to study. It is also interesting in contrast to his previous instances of wanting Buffy's role through wanting to fulfill traditional gender role. In this case, it has nothing to do with gender, and it's just about Xander being whiny. He won't fully depart from gender insecurities for a while, but this is a sign of character growth. Growing boy like you. 